from a master's student of mine, and uh, he did an excellent thesis on uh, one minute hidden layer 10 H networks and uh, and their geometry, and he's going to tell us about that and uh, some other related things, I believe. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Um, so yes, hidden unit acrobatics uh, is what I've called this talk. Um, basically, I'm, I, I, in my thesis, I studied various transformations of neural network parameters that preserve the function that the network is implementing. They preserve it exactly. Um, so these, these transformations are really at the heart of my master's thesis, and I've since um, put uh, two of my main results into um, preprints that are on archive. Um, I can share links to this separately. Um, in fact, the thesis itself is basically just a bunch of what I found to be intuitive, straightforward consequences of uh, a fluency that I kind of developed with these transformations. And so uh, my goal for this talk is to try and communicate that fluency with these transformations to you guys with the kind of operationalization of that goal as the end of this talk, you guys could write my thesis. Um, <laughs> We'll see how we go. And uh, also I'd like to mention a few, what I see as kind of consequences that might be relevant to deep learning or singular learning theory or both of those. So another motivation, well, a main motivation of this stuff is that um, I'd like to refine our pictures of parameter space. Um, so we see these beautiful diagrams from Watanabe. Um, these are from um, the gray book. Um, and the lesson of SLT is that um, Bayesian learning is kind of governed by the structure of singularities of, um, of the parameter space. And we often think of singularities as these intersecting lines on curves and they have these, we draw these fancy sketches. Um, I don't really think that if we looked at, if we could visualize the parameter space in high dimensions for neural networks, we'd get pictures that look like this. I want to have a refined sort of more realistic uh, intuition for the kind of zero sets, for example. Um, with the caveat that singularities are not just zero sets. Um, it also matters um, what is kind of the shape of the lost landscape around the zero sets and so on. Um, but uh, getting a picture of the zero sets is like a first step and also you know, leads to upper bounds on the RLCT and that kind of thing. So it's, it's an important piece of the picture is to have an accurate picture of these curves. So the example where we do have this all sorted out is, um, the simplest case where we can visualize the whole parameter space because we're just talking about a simple neural network with a single input node, a single uh, hidden node, and a single output node. Um, if you use the 10H activation function, then, and you have these weights, then you get something like this as the implemented function. And you can move this uh, parameter around, changing the weights around the parameter space, uh, and you change the function accordingly. Uh, and you can see that the kind of interesting geometry is concentrated around the, uh, the axes. So you can't tell on this plot, but these axes are slightly bolder on the, uh, the left-hand side. Uh, because if I'm here, I'm implementing the zero function. Um, and if I move along this set, I'm still implementing the zero function. If I move up here, I'm still implementing the zero function. Because obviously if either of these weights is zero, the whole network isn't gonna get any signal through. Uh, and this is this axis is the set of parameters in this case where the Fisher information matrix is zero. Um, uh, the cha challenge that I'm kind of want to face is that I want to get this level of intuition or you know something approaching it as we add biases, as we add more hidden units, um, as we add more layers to the network, as we add attention layers, uh, and etc. But for now. Uh, for this talk, we're just going to add some hidden units. We're not going to add biases even um, because I only have a limited amount of time. Um, so here's, a, here's some more uh, units and I'll sort of discuss in general um, sort of notation, 10H, the hyperbolic tangent architecture, single hidden layer, no biases. So we have a parameter vector, which has these outgoing weight, incoming weight pairs for the H hidden units. Um, the associated function is just the sum of all of those units. Um, you obviously you have the nonlinearity. You scale by the input weight. You apply the nonlinearity. You scale by the outgoing weight, and then you add up the result. And uh, I haven't drawn any arrows in my diagrams, but these network compute downwards in, in all of the diagrams here. Uh, so once again, you can kind of you get this kind of function. You can consider moving around 
some of those parameters. Uh, here I'm visualizing in the parameter space. Okay, so this is R6, this parameter space for this three unit network. What I'm doing instead is I'm visualizing each unit as a point in the parameter space. Um, <clears throat> so I've got three points. So this point set is representing a, a six dimensional vector. Um, anyway, so we can consider what it happens when you vary any of the individual units and you can see it's changing the, the contribution to the purple uh, function um, that's represented by one of those 10 H's. So um, some kind of background on like the related work uh, and, and what, I'm, what I've built upon. It's well known that there are various um, transformations you can apply to neural network parameters that don't change the implemented function. Uh, so we're gonna call this property transformation, uh, well, if two parameters have the same implemented function, call that functional equivalence. Um, and here I'm defining it as you have to be equivalent on all inputs. So that's a sort of convenience assumption that practically you push this theory, you would want to relax that and consider like equality on a given data set or something like that. Um, but uh, so for all real inputs, um, the, if the network has the same outputs, then the parameters implementing those networks functionally equivalent. Um, so, uh, symmetries is also, uh, a, 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 that's a typo, obviously you didn't see that until now, uh, a symmetry is a transformation of the parameter space that preserves functional equivalence from you. Uh, well, I've got it here. You, uh, have a weight, you compute the function, you apply the transformation to the weight and you compute the new function and you have functional equivalence. If that's the case for all W, then the transformation T is a symmetry. There are some well-known symmetries, um, of uh, feed-forward neural networks. Uh, in the case of tan H networks, uh, this has been long known that you can swap units. And what that means is you've got a transformation tau ij that exchanges the incoming and outgoing weights of unit i with those of unit j. I think I can uh, attempt to demonstrate this. Um, so let's say we have this unit uh, 1, 1, and we have this unit minus 1, 0 0.7. So I think it corresponds to this dot and this dot. Uh, if you watch the purple line as I uh, move these into position, uh, I think it was something there, it's going to come back to being the same as it was. Um, I haven't got it exactly right there, but you know, you get the picture. I think I have to go. No, that's, was it seven? Oh, this one is wrong. This one needs to be one, one, and this one needs to be seven to be exactly the, the same. There. Um, okay, so that's a unit swap. It's like swapping the, the dots. Um, and as you could also think of it as swapping the units in this graph. Uh, okay, unit flip. This one is unique to uh, tan h because tan h is an odd function. You can take signs in and out of the nonlinearity. Um, if you negate the incoming weight and the outgoing weight, those negations are then gonna cancel out. What that looks like here is if you flip, um, if you flip a unit from one one to negative one, negative one, watch the purple line again in the function, it's gonna come back to where it was. Um, and you can see we've negated these weights. So that's the basics. Um, and you can combine these in various sequences. And in general, then you can apply any permutation to the nodes of the layer and you can apply any sign vector. Or, well, you can, you can negate any subset of those nodes as well. Okay. Um, so uh, it's been known for a while that in this architecture, uh, there are no other analytic symmetries of the parameter space. Um, Another way to say, uh, I think it's a similar, maybe not exactly equivalent result is that, uh, is that of Sussman, which says that two parameters are functionally equivalent if and only if they're related by some combination of flips and swaps, except for some measure zero sets of degenerate parameters uh, where you might need more. Okay, that hasn't really been an emphasis of, of research. Um, and it's the same, you know, non-analytic symmetries would then be, for example, looking at a, uh, looking at symmetries that discontinuously, like they preserve most of the parameter space, but then on a discontinuous, uh, sorry, on a, uh, on a subset, um, they go from just, you know, not change the function and then discontinuously change just these parameters. Um, it's the same, like you just, you're just excluding some subsets of parameters. Um, these results are the site, these are the relevant citations for 10 H networks with one hidden layer, um, but this has been studied. You have similar results for ReLU networks. Uh, the, the, my favorite one to cite is the general work by um, Bolschke from um, ETH Zurich, where 
Um, they proved this for like arbitrary connection graphs and almost arbitrary um, nonlinearities um, in, a, in a nice paper recently. Um, okay, so that's the state of the work before um, I took a look at it, as far as I'm aware. Um, I got really interested in the exceptions here, the non-analytic symmetries or the measure zero sets of degenerate parameters. Um, so if we look at Sussman's results, this uh, except for these measure zero sets, uh, he describes it in exact detail which parameters you're um, excluding. And it's, it's these, reducible parameters. A network is reducible if and only if if meets any of the following conditions, apparently. Uh, so there's four conditions. Um, they're, they're important, so I'm going to emphasize these. First, if any unit has an outgoing weight, that's my A notation, outgoing weight equal to zero, then it's a reducible network. And there might be more symmetries. Uh, sorry, there might be more transformations to equivalent parameters for that network. We're talking about a specific network, so I, I, I don't want to say symmetries because that's about changing the whole parameter space. Um, two, if any unit has an incoming weight equal to zero, that's also excluded. Three, if any pair of units, distinct units, has the same incoming weight, also reducible, that's also excluded. And also, um, if they have the same incoming weight, but one of them is negated. So these uh, conditions, if you have a network that is described by one or more of these conditions, it's a reducible network. And Sussman's result doesn't hold. What that means is, so Sussman said, they're equivalent if and only if they're related by swaps, uh, swaps and flips. In this case, um, there might be more things you can do. And so I studied those more things you can do. When the outgoing weight is zero, it, your unit looks like this. You can see you're allowed to set the incoming weight to anything you like, and it won't change the network because whatever happens is it contributes zero to the overall function. Similarly, if the incoming weight is zero, 10H of zero is zero. So it doesn't matter what you set the output weight to. Okay, when you have two units with the same incoming weight, what happens is you, you, can, you can suddenly collect these units. You can collect these tan H's together. And you can see that if you change, if you increase AI, but decrease AJ, you don't change the sum of these two things. If you keep AI plus AJ constant, uh, you, can, you can move those weights around. And finally, similarly, if you have um, the negated case, um, then you, you collect, but you bring this negative out first. So you do the same thing, but keeping AI minus AJ constant. When you have biases, these conditions get a little bit more subtle, in particular this one, uh, because you have 10H of C here, which is not zero. But you can still change A if you change C to accommodate. So there's still a degree of freedom that's introduced. Uh, that's the main thing that gets more complicated with biases. Um, so here's a demonstration. OK, I was going to give a demonstration. OK, so uh, here we have two units with the same incoming weight, one. You can see it's these two that are above each other. So I should be able to increase the, oh, I haven't put labels on my axes, sorry. I think it's, well, we're about to find out. If I increase this one, that looks like it increases the outgoing weight. Okay, so I increase that to 1.5. And if I decrease this one by 0.5 from 0 0.6 to 0 0.1, it should be bringing me back to the same, uh, the same function as I started with. So that's an example of um, this number three. Uh, okay, I could also maybe reduce that a little bit more and increase this a little bit more to accommodate. And now I have a situation where the outgoing weight is zero. So I should be able to, well, you can see that function has vanished. It's, it's collapsed into the axis. Uh, it's there. Um, I should be able to move B to anything. If I was sort of coordinated enough, that wouldn't change the function. Any questions so far? It's clear so far, hopefully. Excellent. So uh, that's the sort of, intuition with transformations. I'm now going to tell you a little bit about uh, how I push this, this uh, intuition into an understanding of the parameter space. So one thing that you can think about uh, is, well, what I just did here is it looks like I kind of eliminated a unit from the network in some sense. I kind of, previously I had two active points and then I set one of them to the zero function. Um, one thing that I didn't mention, you know, if you, 
put it this way. If you can consider uh, networks with different number of units, if you allow them to be functionally equivalent, like you could have a functionally equivalent network with two hidden units versus three hidden units. When I set the outgoing weight to zero here, it kind of indicates that I could remove that unit entirely and just have a two unit network. In general, each of these reducibility conditions that we identified indicate that you can remove at least one hidden unit. If you repeatedly do that, you end up with a form of lossless compression of your neural network data structure, where you're minimizing the number of nodes that you, hidden units that you use to implement a function. And so I've just spelled those out here. Um, the, these ones are obvious. You can just straight away remove the function, uh, the units. Uh, these conditions are, you have to first um, shift the outgoing weight into one of the units and make the outgoing weight of the other zero, and then you can remove it. And same here, but with a minus sign instead. Um, this leads to an algorithm for lossless compression of neural network data structures. You just iteratively apply these operations. And there are slightly more clever ways to do it to make it not as computationally complex to, to do that. Um, comment on us SLT people maybe look at 10 H networks and feel happy, but many other people look at them and think that's something from the 90s. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. So why why is this like somehow still telling us something or giving us some useful intuition or understanding? Yeah, good point. So thanks for the question. Um, I'll go back up to these, uh, where this, the new symmetries. Um, let's say I was talking about one layer ReLU. Okay, not also the most relevant because it's just one layer, but that's as far as I've got so far. <laughs> um, this, it doesn't depend on tan H. This one doesn't depend on tan H and this one doesn't depend on tan H. Only this one depends on tan H. It's only because of the odd property of tan H that you, that you have this additional uh, transformation you can work with. In ReLU, for example, uh, you wouldn't have this, but you would have a different affine symmetry of the ReLU that corresponds to positive scaling. And that's well known, uh, that, that transformation. And uh, Liam and, and Dan have been sort of showing off, uh, there's some maybe additional ones that show up in ReLU. But a lot of these are kind of inherent more to the feed forward structure than to the particular activation function. And I think that this work could be uh, pushed in a a, a direction that generalizes the architectures we consider, um, and my results would still be a part of the picture. Uh, so it looks like the year after the Sutton paper, then there was something that, that shows that uh, uh, for networks of arbitrary depth and connectivity, and then as long as they use the same nonlinear H for R, uh, then, then basically the first three symmetries are the only things you should ever expect. Uh, That's cool. What's the who's the authors on that one? Um, uh, Blachek and uh, Bolseki, neural network identifiability. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's the one of the ones that I mentioned up here. I think uh -oh. maybe it's it's either this one or it's a, a related paper that yeah, they yeah. released the year after. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's okay. yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So um. So I think that if you want to make it a little bit more difficult to draw pictures, you you would consider these cases and give a talk about it. Um. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, seriously, um, it, it does remain to be sort of systematically, to systematically map out the ways you can do sort of neural network compression uh, on the data structure, lossless compression in those cases. Uh, but I think it will be similar to this case. And as for layers, um, you can start by applying this to each layer independently, and then you can worry about interactions between layers. But the, the per layer case is going to be similar to this. Um, another question? An interesting thing I know is uh, based on a conversation with you listening, um, where uh, in, uh, based on the number two, um, what's it called, transformation, mm -hmm. uh, you could potentially make some progress on superposition. Oh, wait, not the symmetry. Wait, yes, the symmetry. I wrote it down differently in my thing. It's number three on your thing. Mm -hmm. um, you could use that to take one, like invert that, and instead of compressing a network, decompress a network mm. and potentially make progress on superposition. Yeah, this, this is, yeah. Yeah. This is, this is a, something that I've been thinking about. Please do. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah. I, I, I will also comment on 
yeah, I, I do think it's like a dual perspective on this that you could consider compressing or you could consider expanding. Um, you could say, well, I've got my network that I implement and I've got these spare units with zero weights uh, that I would, you know, I could consider pruning them away or I could consider, well, maybe distributing this unit's computation throughout these other units by shifting the outgoing weight to sort of be distributed among them. Okay, I will, uh, so this, this, uh, this concept of compression though, I, I, I find a useful concept for thinking about networks. Uh, often we're interested in like effective number of parameters or something like that. Uh, that seems like a useful uh, concept to refine in deep learning. Um, this gives us an effective number of units um, because you might have a, a network like the example that we had here before we removed the thing. It looks like it has three hidden units and an associated number of parameters, but really the function that it's implementing isn't using all of them to the full capacity. It's more like a two um, unit network, two hidden unit network. And so I would say that the rank of this parameter is two out of a maximum rank of three. Um, I might use that, that, uh, that definition throughout the rest of the talk. Okay, another interesting thing that I found that you can say about the set of equivalent, um, equivalent parameters, functionally equivalent parameters for a given parameter. So we've talked so far about local information. How can you sort of vary by a small amount the parameter values and preserve the network? But um, it turns out that if you take a global look at the set of equivalent parameters, it also has some interesting structure. Namely, uh, I found that it's, uh, there's a piecewise linear path between any pair of equivalent parameters that stays within the set of equivalent parameters. So you can, you can vary using these transformations that I've described, and then you get to another point where new transformations open up and you can vary in that direction, and then you can vary in a different direction, and eventually you can reach a parameter that in, at the start looks quite different, but is functionally equivalent. Question? Maybe you're going to this, but can you finish it up at the end? But do you know what the structure of the, have you tried blowing up the, this, this network? I, I haven't, but people have tried blowing up these networks. And I think an interesting direction for future work would be to apply this intuition to understanding that process and see if it leads to like, is there any structure there other than just crunching the, the blow up? Um, and maybe this would make it easier to- No, that for sure. Yeah. Um, Garrett, did you also have a question? Oh, I thought I saw you raise your hand, but maybe not. Yeah, I know I raised my hand. Okay. <laughs> I maybe will come back. Okay, come back. Um, I see more questions here. The H over two and the seven, is that specific to the one layer three node hidden? Good question. Yes. Let me explain this uh, result and uh, answer your question. Actually, I found after I, or just before I submitted my thesis, this result has been shown in the, from the perspective of expansion rather than compression. I was a little bit disappointed that, you know, I thought I had this nice result, but it's equivalent to one that someone else proved. But this is new, I think. In the case where, um, in the case where you have a low rank parameter, so you've got a lot of spare units that you're not really using, then you can find sh very short paths, seven. That is, I don't know, partially specific. I think you would still get in other architectures, change the activation function. Uh, it's mostly based on the fact that you can, um, you can implement this compression algorithm Sorry, then let me ask you to ask your question one more time. Oh, I was just wondering. If, H over two and seven. Yeah, if it's if if these results are specific to three, the setup you have with three hidden. Great units. question. No. Any number of hidden units could be a thousand. If it's only using five hundred, if the rank is only five hundred. And then you can then you can get from any equivalent parameter to any other equivalent parameter with just seven segments through the three two thousand dimensional it's seven degrees of separation. Yeah. Or if you consider a degree of separation, oh yeah, segments. Yeah. Uh, no, we have to change direction. So. Yeah. Some. Yeah. I, I I'm getting a bit confused now about this seven and how I define the length of a path. I think it's the number of components. So yes. 
Okay, I uh, I had build a live demonstration. Go on. Oh, piecewise. Yeah, piecewise linear path. Components. Uh, what do you mean by component then? Oh, so, so like if the path is like a lightning bolt, then there's like three components. So a lightning bolt would be length three, but it doesn't matter how long. The oh, like a linear are. A path is literally a linear. Part. A piece of the piecewise linear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, a maximal segment. I mean, we're talking about shortest path, so it doesn't matter. But you could. It's a piecewise linear path if you just go in the same direction twice. Right, right, right. But yeah. that counts as one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Another question. Yeah. Uh, this was the one that I had earlier. Um, which is is the thing that you've shown about uh equivalent parameters. Assuming that the single that the um, only symmetries there are are yours, or is this like even if there's some weird wonky symmetry which is a result of the data that you use, um, and how it like mixes with your uh mm. network, uh, this is also the case there. I haven't studied that case. Mm -hmm. If there are more symmetries, I would be inclined to think that there would be you know, these paths don't go away but the connectivity property might go away. There might be more symmetries that create a disconnected set of equivalent parameters and you can't reach that. Um, so these paths will still exist because if you, if you add, uh, if you increase the size of the equivalent set that, you know, these paths stay inside the original set. And so they're inside the superset. Um, but um, yeah, I haven't studied that further. It's a great, it's a very important question because connecting this to the mode connectivity uh, empirical literature, I think goes through that because that's, based on the loss, uh, I'll comment on that. Uh, I'm gonna skip, I was gonna do a live demonstration of the path, but I'm gonna come back to that if we have time. Because I have a couple of other interesting things and I wanna give you some cake. Um, so detecting proximity to low rank re regions. This was the other main result uh, of, of my thesis and um, a, a preprint is, uh, exists on this as well. Um, it's easy to recognize when your parameter has low rank, but it probably doesn't have low rank because it's a measure zero set. You know, these constraints require exact equality to zero. Um, numerically, you know, we don't expect to see that in practice or anything. Uh, it would be nice if we could tell, if we could sort of relax the constraints a little bit. Um, and I, a way that I think is interesting to, to say, ask the question is, are we within epsilon distance of the set of rank R parameters where rank is some, R is some low rank? For example, I have a 1000 hidden unit network. Is my parameter within epsilon distance of the set of parameters that have rank 500? Unfortunately, that question, uh, it turns out is an NP complete question. And that was a result of uh, my thesis. Um, however, it doesn't seem like it's a very, very hard problem in you know typical instances. Uh, with NP completeness, you often see that um, some instances are actually, you know, pretty easy to solve uh, either exactly or to a good approximation factor. And there are some worst case instances that are really hard and take you like exponential time um, with the algorithms we know. But uh, so, so I have hope that this is not too big a problem, but it is an interesting, it's also an interesting property that this kind of computational complexity shows up within this set. I think it says that the set is kind of computationally rich um, in, you yeah. know interesting but inconvenient way or something like that okay cake um so we have the traditional model of parameter space which is um you just have uh the basic flip and swap symmetries which means you can divide your parameter space into slices and each slice looks like this piece of cake uh it just um the interior it's like a reflected version of the other slices of the cake the parameter space um the interior contains one copy of each mathematical function you might want to implement with your parameters. There's a parameter in there that will implement it. On the interior, the boundaries are a little bit weird. Uh, we're going to exclude them from consideration. That's the traditional model. My insights into this uh, are that the boundaries contain the reducible parameters. Well, OK, that was known. That was like the definition. Um, but they're actually not that complex to describe their additional transformations, their additional symmetries that act on just this uh, discontinuous subset. Um, you can map them out and say interesting things. So I, I described the various operations that apply in that case. Um, interesting combinations of them lead to this idea of lossless compression. Other interesting combinations lead to building these paths through this slice 
uh, or through, or you can think of it as, you know, uh, as you could go like over here and you could end up back at the axis and then you could come out along the boundary of some other slice or something like that. It's, it's basically, that's what the paths are doing. And the seven is because it requires like two paths to get to the center and then uh, three paths to like rotate and then another two paths come out if, if it's sufficiently, if you have enough spare units. That's the basic idea of that, that proof. Um, on that note, um, the reducible functional equivalence classes are complex networks of these piecewise, piecewise linear connected, um, piecewise linear paths. Um, you have these core, this core of units that have all of your, all of your, um, all of your redundancy is kind of pushed into the, the minimal set of units that can express it. And you have a bunch of blank units with just zeros as the incoming and outgoing weights. Uh, and permutations and flips are the main symmetries acting on that set. So you've got piecewise linear paths connecting those in like a network, um, like a fully connected network or something like that. Uh, and then you have branching off from this in various different directions in the cake. Um, you can split units and you can uh, take your units that have zero outgoing weight and just vary the incoming weight and so on. Um, as I mentioned, the case with biases is slightly more intricate but it's not that much more intricate. You still, you know, have four different things and it's like one of the cases gets a little bit more subtle. It also means it goes from algebraic, like it goes from the whole functional equivalence class instead of being a union of hyperplanes, it's like a, it's, it's analytic. It has some like curved surfaces. So it's a little bit more complex, but it's, it's manageable um, from, for this work. Multi-dimensional inputs and outputs, basically the same. You just use vectors instead of scalars and it all works. Uh, both of that is worked out in more detail in my thesis if you're interested in the details. Okay, uh, that's time for my talk. I do have more to say. Can I just get some comment from the organizers on how we should proceed? Yeah, got it. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so I do want to say what, you know, comment on on the connection to SLT and, and maybe a motivation for studying these parameters, because I think a, um, uh, a, the, the first objection is the one that was, the reason that these, this case was dismissed in the first place is that this measure zero set of a high dimensional parameter space, you know, these, these networks, these parameters are never gonna show up. Why do we care? One reason is that learning is not the same as randomly sampling. So measure zero is like not sufficient to rule out a particular parameter set for being uh, interesting or showing up in practice in learning because learning, you know, it applies a non-random selection pressure. You, we, we should use the data to decide whether or not these are relevant. Um, I don't, I don't have strong evidence that they are. I think that's a future, future work um, question. Um, there are some, there are some advantages and some motivating reasons why we might consider these parameters, these reducible parameters to be interesting. A minimum description length uh, argument, uh, degrees of freedom, um, Normal parameters, you can't vary them at all without changing the function, uh, but these ones you can. Um, that's you, lossless compression. You know, you're using fewer units. It's more parsimonious and so on. Occam's razor, blah, blah, blah. Um, another thing to say is that in the overparameterized regime, as soon as you have one more unit than you need to represent your data set perfectly, then that means that one of the interpolating solutions in deep learning is a reducible network. And that means its entire functional equivalence class is inside the set of interpolating parameters. And if you go to a heavily over, over uh, parameterized regime, then there are even many more of these. And the, the ones that have the most intricate sort of structure, uh, this you know, seven uh, component connectivity, in that set of interpolating pr parameters, those are the most reducible ones. I think, that's, you know, I think this means that um, reducible parameters are part of the story of, of deep learning. Um, also, it's true that they're theoretically important parameters, even if they're not important in practice. So we think I, I can draw on the other talks in the, at this workshop to say that we have reason to believe that singularities might play an important role in learning to be determined how much we should um, sort of how much we can get from that. Um, and these parameters, in the case of one hidden layer 10 H, there's a result from Fukumizu who says that uh, the Fisher information matrix is singular, as in it's non-invertible, if and only if you are at a reducible parameter. 
I, I think there will be, for example, in ReLU, it's singular everywhere because you have the, the, uh, the positive scaling symmetry. But um, in ReLU networks, the reducible parameters are going to be even more singular in some sense. So singular learning theory says that these parameters seem important. Um, OK, I already said this. You can never really reach a low rank parameter due to numerical imprecision. You know, Even if you're going for like parameter equals 0, you're going to end up with 0 0.0001 or something in floating point. Um, OK, I think you could come close enough that an approximate version of the theory holds. Um, and we've also already discussed uh, in, in the primer, um, even if you don't crash into these reducible regions, um, their neighborhoods might be influenced and possibly beyond just even the, the closest points. These you know, singularities might determine, there might be landmarks in the lost landscape that determine the kind of structure around them. They influence the structure around them. You have things like basins of attraction. and You look at the, the phase plots we were looking at um, in differential, um, what was it, dynamical systems or whatever um, in the primer. Um, and there is also some work already that shows that these points are, are used to find um, interesting, you know, uh, saddle points and local minima in, in lost landscapes. Um, okay, so an open empirical question is, do we actually ever come into the orbit of these parameters in practice? Um, question, Zach? Uh, well, I was just going to mention, like, um, would it not, if you have a reducible, um, at like a degenerate node symmetry, that would result in the rank of the weight matrix being like not full rank, right? I think it's not quite the same rank that I've talked about is not quite the same as the rank of the weight matrix because of, okay, this is going to lead to lower rank. This is going to lead to lower rank. This is going to lead to lower rank, but also BI equals alpha BJ would equal because these are like columns or something. Yeah. Uh, and that's, so alpha BI equals alpha BJ means lower rank, but not, um, uh, this kind of symmetry. And this one is going to lead to lower rank, but only for, uh, it's only a symmetry for 10 H. And so, so there's like some slight differences. Right. Uh, but the point was, I was just going to make was that uh, empirically we see like low rank like weight matrices and even like very large networks are like uh -huh. pretty low rank. So that would be one, one piece of evidence. Yeah. Thank you. I, 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 I think I, I'm not super well versed in this literature, but, um, but I do think there's lots of evidence that significant pruning is often possible. And pruning is also clearly related to this concept of lossless compression by removing units. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think, I think it, the next step is to directly try and test probe for rank related observables um, in, these, in these experiments. Um, skip over this note and just talk about the good stuff. Next step slash open problems. So I want to work on some of these things this week. So if anyone's interested, you should talk to me. Um, so the relevance in practice. So we're talking about this. So in practical deep learning, are learned neural networks near low rank regions? Concrete question. We can train a neural network, see if we can figure out, despite the NP completeness, uh, if we can detect that it is um, near a low rank um, region. Um, I would want to do this before spending a bunch of time uh, doing the math to figure this out for ReLU and multi-layers and so on. Um, eventually though, I think that it wouldn't, it, it's an interesting theory project. It's like, uh, and, and pretty straightforward to do this kind of analysis. What does lossless compression of attention layers look like, for example? Um, okay, so we know that reducible parameters are information singularities, but what role do they play in the SLT story? So. Are these neighborhoods of these low rank regions are good candidates for phases? Um, they might be good candidates based on like a complexity if phases are meant to represent the sort of levels of complexity. But uh, this connection remains to be it's speculative. It remains to be worked out a little, in a little bit more detail. I'm not the best one to do that, I think, but um, I can comment on the, the low rank part and someone else can figure out the, the phase and the RLCT part. Um, um, we already, uh, this came up as a question. I think we could potentially use uh, this intuitive or this more uh, refined understanding of the structure of parameter space to improve our ability to uh, get a grip on the RLCT. Um, simply counting the degrees of freedom can lead to an upper bound on the RLCT. 
um, but there may be more uh, complex geometry. For example, if you have like mutually exclusive degrees of freedom where you can move in this direction or this direction, but not both, that's gonna not be accounted for by just counting the degrees of freedom. Um, and also you could have like quartic rather than quadratic variants away from the degree of freedom and, and that would change as well. Um, finally, this is an important point and I'll end on this. Um, we only consider exact, well, I only consider exact functional equivalence. And as I said before, on the entire input space, this is a major limitation of, of this uh, theoretical approach so far. And it's not clear to me how we can get beyond this, um, but it, it's important because there will be more ways in which two networks can be functionally equivalent on discrete subset of the parameter space, like a data set. Um, significantly more ways that you can do that that are not like these at all, because they can vary in, arbitrarily away from the data set. And, you know. um, in addition, there will be more ways in which two networks can be similar as functions rather than exactly equal. That might not have anything to do with whether or not they have similar representations in parameter space. And there's a result uh, from Peterson et al. that uh, 2021, I think, uh, I sent this paper to Zach, I can send it to anyone who's interested, about inverse instability in the parameter function map that says you can have two functions that are close in function space, but have no parameters implementing them that are close in parameter space. So these cases exist and have been found, and this theory doesn't account, my theory doesn't account for them. And finally, there will be more ways in which two networks have similar loss than if they implement identical functions, even on the data set. Uh, because I, I don't know, just imagine like trying to fit a line of best fit to a line of points. You could have a function under here versus over here. Nothing like alike as functions, but they're going to have similar loss because the um, just on different sides of the data. And you know, you can do similar things. Like you could also go up and over and you know, that kind of thing. Um, so the curves discussed here are part of the story, but not the whole story. And I think there's some existing work on studying uh, low-lying regions of the lost landscape. Um, and I think this could be part of the story and helpful, um, but I'm not across that work. I, I think it's a good place to start. Uh, and you can ask me if you want references. And also Zach said he's gonna solve this in his master's thesis. So <laughs> just wait a year and ask him. Uh, that's all. Which one? Just the theory of the inverse instability parameter map, Peterson. Peterson et al. Zach, do you have the name handy? Yeah, I can, I can bring it up. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. This is the this is the paper. Yeah. Also seen, uh, I know there's at least a, at least one paper. I think there might be a couple that are like about what are the like identifiability of relo nets given some big size data set or whatever. I saw at least the cup one or two. I think on that. I I've seen a bunch of papers on this. I haven't really uh, deeply understood them um, because yeah. I I sort of probed them for whether or not they did anything to do with lossless compression and they didn't. And I was like. Phew. I don't have to worry about that until after my thesis. <laughs> um, yeah. Any other questions, Liam? It might be a slightly taboo question, but I'm interested to ask nonetheless, how do you think about this line of work in relation to dual use stuff? Uh, I think it's the same as um, just under deep, deep science of deep learning, like understanding deep learning. It's the same. And I don't really have an up-to-date opinion on, on that. This was for me, uh, positive impact because I get my master's thesis, I become a researcher, I save the world. <laughs> okay, so what we're scheduled now is to walk. That's it. Yeah, we'll see the 3.30 and then we're going to return here for some more of the working session. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, so maybe people want to put their laptops away or whatever, so we need to engineer. Yeah, five minutes.